Welcome to Breen's at the Gate. This is our video blog for November 19th, 2018. Uh, we are past the midterm elections. So I think we can start decompressing on that a little bit. There have been some discussions, though, about how we should think about the results of the election, maybe what they mean for larger issues of American culture, more broadly speaking. So, Bert, interesting article that maybe we should start out with our discussion. Uh, thank you. There's an interesting piece in the New York Times. It's been almost a week ago now where... Uh, Paul Krugman was discussing what he calls Senate America, and he's bemoaning the fact that we have a Senate where the representation, uh, say for Wyoming, whom he mentions, that uh, 600,000 people is the same as for uh, California at 40 million. So he says that the real America is uh, suburban, it's urban. Rural America is not real America. He calls that Senate America, and would really like to see things changed about. Yes. It's a pretty harsh, uh, pretty <coughs> harsh critique, I think, in some ways. We also have news coming out this week that Amazon is uh, going to be locating their new headquarters. Is this their second headquarters? Is that second, what they're calling yeah, it? Second headquarters. A second headquarters in Washington, D.C., in New York City, sort of mm -hmm. a divided uh, campus, so to speak. So I guess the first question, Jeff, is how do these things fit together? Let's start there. Well, he... Uh, our, our great economist Paul Krugman uh, suggests that this is this is just illustrative. When when Amazon goes to these big inner cities, that's they're going to where America is. Look, that the, the talent is all there. They have to go there for business decisions, and that's an indication of the sin in America, as, as, as Dr. Wheeler was suggesting, is is much smaller and less meaningful to the economic success of these firms. So they have to go to the cities. So that's what what he's alleging, and and, and I think he's he's right there as far as he goes for those companies going to cities, but I think he fails to uh, to acknowledge that, that where they went has a, clearly a political uh, a tone to it. To go to Washington D.C. Uh, we were commenting before the show started. Uh, s there was at least one one writer in, I believe it was in the Wall Street Journal, many months ago, said this is all a charade. They're going to Washington D.C. because of the po the political power center, and and then they go to the financial center as well. So it, it, I'm sure that many of the other states and, and cities had a, a competitive bid, but it's not simply they're going to where the talent is. Right. They're going to where the political power is, right. and so that's kind of a some of our cronyism and work. And I'm sure we'll talk more about how the benefits went. Yeah, I mean, Mark, real quick, how do you how do you follow this up with research that's come out in the last few years, people like Charles Murray, Robert Putnam, and others who've sort of looked at this yeah. sociologically, what's happening in this sort of division between rural and urban and, and suburban. Urban. Yeah. How, how does their research fit into this? <clears throat> well, he says that there's there are a few zip codes that have the most wealthy people living in them. They're also where many of the jobs are going and have been going the last few years. And he's right in a sense, they go where there already there's an educated pool of, of people. That's a, that's a factor in this whole thing already. But of course, the way Murray puts it, and I think he's, he's got a point here, this is further splintering the population and to not just different uh, occupations, but different kinds of cultures. You have the urban elite culture, you have the rural supposedly not so elite, not so bright culture. This is what they're often sure, perceived right. to be. And, and, and furthermore, these companies that you mentioned too, I have to throw the economic issue in, uh, they got over $500 million in incentives to locate, right. relocate too. So, I mean, Amazon did to, to locate. That's a huge crony capitalist. Um, well, and that was, that was actually bemoaned uh, just a couple of days ago by our new incoming Congresswoman, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, <laughs> who essentially said, this is, uh, this is fraudulent. There's no reason the government should be subsidizing billion plus dollar companies like Amazon to do sure. these sorts of yeah. things. Is this, is this an area where One cheer maybe the radical left yes. and yes. the <laughs> Radical right, let's call ourselves, can actually see some agreement. I mean, Bert, what do you think? Well, I, I agree with that. Yes, yeah. I, I always thought that the uh, extremes uh, in, in political philosophy tend to, it's not a, a line, it's more of an oval, and we tend yeah. to kind of rub shoulders on some issues, and I think this would mm -hmm. be one. Yeah, I, I think Murray was just describing you know, he what was. he saw. Yeah. But that's yeah. what's happening. And, and what Krugman is saying here is that I think he's agreeing with it, but he's talking about the political he's realities yeah, right. uh, that come yeah. from this a really bifurcation mm -hmm. of our of our culture, of our society. Yeah. But he may, but here's a problem he has. The founders had a reason. Mm -hmm. You could argue that it was pragmatic to get the Constitution ratified, but I think it's justifiable too. It, 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 you can't justify the reasons for having a House and a Senate that are elected or chosen differently. And one gives states representation, and one gives population representation. And there's a reason for that. There's a good reason for that. 
So I think Krugman wants to almost act like he, write, he writes as if he'd like to see that abolished. Oh, I, 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 I read that. I read that <laughs> completely into what he's saying. And if the Senate was functioning as a deliberative body to uh, discuss and debate deeper, longer term topics, if we had the House coming in quicker and being more connected to the people, uh, then I can see it making some sense. Right. I, this is just going to be a hard thing to, I think, <clears throat> hold on to over time with the changing demographics that we have and with the shifting, uh, I don't see them shifting anymore, but with the power centers, the economic centers being on the coast. Uh, yeah. I think this is going to be uh, an interesting uh, topic in, in years to come. Has that there any be. way this reverses at some point or at least starts to even out a little bit? I mean, is there a point at which those uh, wealthy urban centers become so expensive and so mm -hmm. saturated that you're going to start to see companies, other people, maybe come back to the Midwest and back to the heartland for cheaper real estate and other things? I mean, that's already ongoing, but, but that doesn't overcome his point of, of uh, and certainly Murray's point, where they're gravitating to the urban centers yeah. when they go. I mean, California, we just saw, has yet again had another year of et net out-migration. Yeah, right. People are fleeing California in the high tax, and they're going to uh, Nevada, and then they're going to Arizona, and they're going increasingly to Texas. But then that means Texas is increasingly going to be blue, and it's to the urban right. areas of Austin. But it's to Dallas. Yeah, it's, it's to Dallas. Salt Lake City. Still, it's still right. the, yeah. very, the urban areas as they leave. So the rural areas you don't see as having much of a vibrancy or an this opportunity is, to come back at some point? This has always or? been the case in yeah. history. Yeah. People have always flocked to cities for the amenities, uh, for the, the good things in life that they want to have besides just a job. So it, it's hard to say this is all bad, right? But what's different now than, say, 200 years ago? I mean, why, then why is it worse than it is 200 years ago that, people, that the trend is different, dramatically different? Because, I, mean, I mean, I agree with you. We've I always mean, had this tension between town yeah. and country yeah. and these sorts of things, but... It's a lot more it feels different now. But it's a lot more pleasant to be in a city today. Uh, you know, it's a lot more pleasant. Three, four hundred years ago, yeah. think disease, sewage in a crime, city, disease, yeah. all these crime, kinds of yeah. things, crime. Sure. Uh, they still right, right. It's a lot go. more right. uh, <laughs> hospitable to be in a city today. Yeah, right. you're right, it is. So people like living in cities. I mean, Younger people especially like living in these loft apartments and mm -hmm. things like that. It's just kind of a vibrant kind of culture and lifestyle. But what we're talking about here is that's where the opportunities are. In yeah. terms yeah. of too. employment yeah. and work. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 It, there, there may not be as much in the country now as we're less and less green. So we don't say, need many people. Uh, yeah, Actually. the agricultural industry yeah. used to give some economic heft right. to the country. Mm -hmm. It's right. pretty much dissipating to some extent. Yeah, the, the uh, employment in agriculture is really what, l less than 9% or something of total employment or something like that? 9, 10%, I, I think? It's small. It's very Historically small. very small. Yeah. 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 And shrinking. And, and shrinking. shrinking. Yeah. yeah. So this is, we have a cultural dynamic, we have a political dynamic, we have all these different things sort of unfurling, and you just see this as heading in one direction. Is that fair? I do right now, yeah. I don't see a reversal too much. <laughs> now, small businesses could make a difference, right? They get started in a particular location, then they grow, and will they stay there? That's the question, right? I, I don't know. There's so many dynamics, so running a business, being around other uh, industries or cost savings, and this is simply the way economic development unfolds. You know, uh, trade is about you know, where people are in cities, mm -hmm. and uh, I, yeah, I don't really see it uh, tr changing. It's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, politically right. with Trump, particularly uh, really uh, anchoring in the shrinking sector. Uh, what that will do for the Republicans, yeah. losing the Reagan Democrats. Uh, yeah. it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens as this unfolds. Yeah. Some of these bigger uh, areas, you know, Texas may be a, a Democratic stronghold in, in X number of years. Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. Uh, you know, about 70% yeah. of the population now is uh, around a, uh, an area that has uh, 500,000 or more people. Yep. So, you know, it's going to be, yeah. uh, you know, I don't see any, any change from that. The prototype for this is Montana right now. Montana was a very red state until just a few years ago. Now people from California are moving there. It's a great place to live, and they're bringing all their political ideologies with them. It's turning purple, very much purple. Is there any chance the Internet affects some of this? I mean, because I think historically, I agree with yeah. you, yeah. a lot of benefits to being yes. in a limited geographical area, share resources, share brain power to some extent. Does the Internet flatten that out to some degree to where you're going to see some more likelihood of... Mm -hmm maybe being able to live and relocate and be a little bit more diverse in our geography? It, it can, but I, it can I, help everything. Yeah, right. I, I really expected it too. I mean, I, when we, yeah. the internet first came onto the scene, you know, 25 years ago, started, right. 
I thought that that was going to free people to actually go the other direction. You'd have people, because I always wanted to live up in the mountains of Colorado. Right. I imagine <laughs> right. I could have internet, I could just work and have all this. I thought that that's what people right. want, but they don't. They want these they other want accoutrements and, and society that you can have in a city. So, so it's clearly the network effects can be overcome to a large degree online, but it never seems to be uh, able to completely overcome the human effects culture. of networking and, and the culture. I mean, we yeah. see that certainly in Silicon Valley. It's, it's, it's the proximity of the firms. And even, for, I've, I've talked about this before, my, my son is out there working now, and, and the, the, the game is it's almost a shell game between these young people and the, uh, the employers. And that's one area where they actually are okay with stealing each other's talent because they all do it. But that's how they g get the best knowledge sharing amongst sure. all of them. Mm -hmm. And all of them seem to benefit, and that proximity lends itself to that to a large degree. Yeah. I, a couple of questions. So what does this mean for the future of the Republican Party? Can the Republican Party be competitive in cities, mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't been for a while. No, do you think it's possible? <clears throat> that, that doesn't look real promising to me. Why for, not? This, for the urban areas, uh, well, besides the, it, it, it's not looked promising for a while. That's true, uh, for various reasons. But I don't see the people who tend to want to go to the cities as being, at least for now, the younger generations, as being as oriented toward conservatism as they are attracted to a more liberal kind of political ideology. Some even socialist. They're willing to entertain socialism. We've seen that in some of the latest surveys. And they're going to keep moving to the cities. Those are the people that want to go to those cities. And they're going to have this confluence of moving to cities plus their propensity to be attracted to these liberal ideas. Anybody else? What do you think? Republicans have a chance then? Our... I, I think that, uh, you know, Clearly, if you just look at trends, we would say the trends are looking in an ominous direction, right? Yeah. But, but what we see always about these trends is they never come out the way people expect. Okay. Right. And so, so politically, right. we see a lot of changes. Uh, you know, we, we've been waiting for this, this coming Democrat, you know, democratic yeah, the, the way for yeah. the That's democratic right. deficit. That's true. It's been in years. And, yeah. and it's not clear at all. For instance, immigration, it's not clear that that, that, uh, that uh, group will, will turn out to be reliably as democratic as they expect it to be. There's lots of factors in there. The other thing to remember about this is life is conservative because liberalism fails. And when it fails and people grow and they mature and they see these, these results that don't end up looking like they want, and these things are unfolding all the time. I mean, you can ignore yeah. uh, Venezuela and you can ignore uh, North Korea for a while, but eventually, uh, Illinois declares bankruptcy and Connecticut mm -hmm. declares bankruptcy because yeah. of the profligacy of these kinds of policies. They yeah. just do not work over a long-term sustainment. And so these things tend to, to, to bear out. So you're asking what happens when a 25-year-old becomes a 45-year-old? Yeah, yeah, exactly. He exactly. could change it's his mind. It's not a given. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. That's true. What about maybe more appropriately in some ways? What does this mean for the future of the gospel in America? I mean, don't cities provide particular challenges to the gospel? But we could go back to the ministries of yeah. uh, Dwight Moody and others that sort of confronted this issue so, 100 years ago. I, I'm seeing, and, and uh, you guys have as many students as I do, more so, I'm seeing a lot of our young students have a desire to go yep. into yep. the inner city yep. and, and, and use that as a gospel platform. Yes. So I'm, I'm encouraged by what I, I've seen some good examples of, of real prosperity of the gospel. Uh, not gospel, yeah. not prosperity, <laughs> yeah. gospel. Please, yeah, please be careful. But flourishing of the gospel, yes, I should you. say. Yeah. <laughs> In inner city areas, I mean, just take some of the examples like Capitol Hill Baptist or Tim Keller's church in New York City. Those are just a couple of examples I could point to. And those are thriving. And I think we'll see more of those. We are seeing more of them. I see pop them popping up in Dayton, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. yeah. So, Bert, what do you think? Well, I, I'm not quite as certain. I, I think that um, you know, the, the gospel will redeem where it is proclaimed. Whether or not we as a church are as active in proclamation as we need to be, as we could be, is another story. Now, I think you may see uh, examples like you're talking about. There's always been a remnant. But if you look at just self-reporting, what people report in terms of their own religious uh, makeup, uh, you know, we're con the church is continuing to waver. It's, again, it's not that we don't see instances. You know, Cedarville, in, in some ways, is, is a bright spot on, on the, uh, uh, on the bubble. Christian horizon. But overall, in terms of the country, I, I see the drift of the country being demonstrably towards the left, uh, lurching that way, coming back a step, going. I don't see it changing. Unless, the political left or the theological left? Uh, both. Okay. But the political left is really what I'm thinking. Okay. Uh, and I don't really see it changing unless there's some, some real catastrophic reason for it to change. As long as it's soft and easy, 
we're going to continue to move in that direction. Uh, that's that's what I, I think. You know, do uh, a while ago you asked about the Republican Party. If the Republican Party moves more centrist, that they may have uh, uh, some some hope. And I think the same thing for the Democratic Party. I think if the Democratic Party runs way left crazily, yeah. that that's going to be problematic for them. Yeah, it will uh, be, uh, yeah. but I don't think they're going to. Yeah, uh, they may just have to silence some of the young young bucks. Yeah. In How long can they do that though? <laughs> well, they can't do it. They cannot do it forever because the young so, bucks do age. Wasn't yeah. didn't Jack Kemp talk about this stuff in the 1970s and 1980s? <laughs> He did Republicans didn't do a very good job listening to him at that point. No, so. they didn't, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right, uh, Jeff, you want to spend a couple of seconds here talking about the markets right now, what's going on, sort of the up and down nature of what's happening? Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting time in the markets, and, and for us as Bereans to be aware, we don't know where markets are going to go. This is not a financial conference. <laughs> but, but what we see is, is, is that we've been talking about this for a while, at least I have some on, on the, uh, the normalization of interest rate policy. We're now starting to get to where it's becoming meaningful. We've had a decade of, of the federal government managing kind of the economic and the credit cycle through the Fed. They've always done it to agree, but never before to this where we've had a sustained decade of, of effectively negative interest rates for mm -hmm. firms. And now we're even now getting back to the point where it's not quite... Uh, zero real interest rate and that's causing some stress in the financial markets. You're seeing the turbulence every day on that. I don't know where this goes but when a venerable company such as GE is just a hair's breadth away mm -hmm. from having its bonds go to junk status and then what will happen as the the different investment vehicles have to unload once it gets that designation what this does, this, this suggests that uh, the unwinding, we've always known that the unwinding of this massive portfolio that the Federal Reserve has done, it's an experiment never done, and we just don't know where this is going to go. Uh, but it, it suggests, as always, we want to be prudent in what we do with our own lives, and we, we need yeah. to be thinking that, hey, the stock market isn't necessarily where we're going to have, have good results. We've got right. a very highly valued stock market, in large part due to the low interest rate policy of the Fed. When they raise interest rates, what does that do to stock market valuations, and, and where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. You couple that with what Mr. Trump's doing with trade, this is all uncertainty. I think you're starting mm -hmm. to see some of those stressors going on. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I'm observing. I think it's, when we talk about interesting times politically, yeah. we're getting ready to potentially have some very interesting times, unfortunately, uh, economically, at least from a market. And right. not unrelated. Not unrelated. Mm -hmm. Not unrelated, that's good. All right, thanks very much for listening. Thanks for viewing. If you have any questions, Send them, please, to Matt's Magnificent Monday Mailbag, as you can see in our comments and other places. But thanks for tuning in.